So I am here to introduce my friend and colleague, Emily Stanley, and when I started to think about what I wanted to say, it became obvious right away that this was going to be difficult, because there's so many amazing things that I could say about Emily. She is a professor in the Department of Zoology in the Center for Limnology at UW-Madison, um, and she's an aquatic biogeochemist and ecosystem ecologist who started out working mainly with streams, but she has really diversified and expanded her repertoire to include wetlands and lakes too. And she's also very diverse in terms of the types of um, systems she's worked in, in terms of she started out with deserts, and she works with systems under ice. She works with Norse temperate systems all over the place, so very diverse. Uh, she made a joke recently <laughs> that she was like a raccoon with shiny objects. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but really, I, I think it's, it's quite, it speaks to uh, her ability to be uh, flexible and adaptive and to, that she really cares about doing science that's relevant. Um, so as I said, it's really hard to say too many good things about Emily. She is quite amazing. She's garnered funding from a wide variety of sources like USGS, USDA, Sea Grant, and NSF. She's received numerous awards and fellowships, uh, such as the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program. Uh, she's been part of many syntheses and working groups like at NCs and the Powell Center. She's a really great citizen to her discipline um, and to society as a whole. She serves on a number of editorial boards and she's served on funding panels and scientific advisory boards that inform science and policy and management. Um, she's really quite amazing. Uh, and then I wouldn't be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how great of a mentor she is for early career scientists. She's quite a good mentor as well. On a personal level, I'm very happy to collaborate with Emily on data-intensive freshwater macrosystems uh, ecology research. She's a really great team member who always contributes and is always striving to advance science. It's just been really a pleasure to work with her closely over the last five years. She's also the lead PI for the uh, North Temperate Lakes Long-Term Ecological Research Study in Wisconsin, which I believe is why she was asked to talk to us today and what she's going to speak with us about. I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say, and I hope you are too. So let's thank Emily. Thanks, Kendra, for that um, humbling introduction. And I want to also thank Kendra and Tammy and B and all the organizers uh, for this invitation. It really is a great honor to be here to talk to you guys. Uh, a little intimidating. Um, as well, and in particular knowing that I am the one thing standing between you and the courtyard, so um, I will try to not go the entire, was someone asked me if I was going to talk for an hour and 15 minutes, I will try not to do that. Uh, no. So um, when I was invited to give this talk, uh, Tammy sent me an email and said that we are especially interested in hearing about your work with the North Temperate Lakes LTER site. Uh, and why long-term research is valuable. So what I want to do this afternoon uh, with my time here, where you guys are captive, is I will talk a bit. First, I'm going to talk about long-term research, uh, uh, the LTER program, excuse me, and long-term research in Wisconsin. Let's see if I... Um, and from that, I'm going to talk about some broad lessons that I have learned from doing long-term research, both personally as the PI of the uh, North Temperate Lakes site, and I think just general lessons that have been learned from doing long-term research by many individuals. And then uh, I'm going to talk a bit about long-term data records. Uh, and finally, what I want to do is to take these three elements and put them together and hopefully convince all of you uh, that right now uh, is a very good, good time, and lakes in particular are really great places actually to be doing long-term uh, research. So we'll see if I have some success on that front. Okay, so I, have, I am standing on the shoulders of giants, and I would like to acknowledge that I really am sort of a spokesperson uh, for a couple of different projects. First, definitely the, uh, oh, that didn't go forward. I am having... Uh, I'm having some button issues and I will get over it shortly. Okay, so uh, first is a large group of individuals who have been part of the North Temperate Lakes Long-Term Ecological Research Program since 1981. 
I think if I were to put all the faces on the slide, I would have three or four slides. So this is just a snapshot. I see some people in the audience looking for their faces uh, of some currently active individuals. And it really, uh, I want to thank all of these people. And uh, the other group that I would like to thank is on the bottom of the slide there, uh, the CSI Limnology Group. This is a macrosystems biology group that uh, I have had the good privilege of being involved with where I got to work with Kendra. And this too has been just a fantastic collaboration that has really taught me a lot about science over both large spatial scales and long temporal scales. All right, so what is the LTER program? I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. I don't want to make any assumptions. Uh, the long an NSF-supported program uh, that actually began discussion about it in 1977. Uh, their first R request for proposals went out in 1980. And there were sort of four or five main reasons uh, for this program being proposed. And really, first and foremost, was recognizing that three years, which of course is the period, the duration of your average grant, uh, is really not long enough to capture some important phenomena that may be stretching out over, say, you know, four years or five years. Uh, but is to be able to detect long-term trends or changes or processes that unfold beyond that three-year envelope. Uh, and also to provide a context for research that does go on in three years. For example, if you're studying floods uh, and you go out and do your research and you have 17 floods in that particular year, was that a normal year or not? Uh, you need the long-term data to know that. And of course, the other side of this was to be more comprehensive in terms of the variables that were being measured. There's a mandate to measure variables in five core areas uh, that each LTER site must meet. So another way of looking at this is this diagram that was put together originally by John Magnuson of looking at spatial and temporal scales. Uh, and really the idea here was recognizing that there were certain phenomena that were probably important ecosystem drivers like fires uh, and El Nino events and so forth that were happening in this time scale that John Magnuson has referred to as the invisible present sort of this scale of what I think of as the career length scale, somewhere between a few years and decadal scale, that we just really aren't particularly good at seeing trends and changes that go on in that particular area. And the other side of it is that, again, NSF is trying to fill the gap here between the sort of the traditional three-year grant that is sort of the short-term focus, and then these longer time scales that we may be able to capture through paleoecological or paleolimnological methods. So again, the sweet spot they're hitting there is that middle time scales of years to centuries um, to fill that gap. Oops. And really what this is able to do then is to be able to capture phenomena that are slow and unfolding, such as changing climate regimes, uh, rare or episodic events, extreme storms, for example, uh, variables are in ecosystems that may be highly, vari uh, that have a lot of variability, so it's difficult to figure out trends or patterns because of that variance. And of course, complex uh, relationships that basically define ecosystems and therefore may have nonlinear responses or lag responses to ecosystem drivers. And this is really, I think, the heart of what the LTER program hoped to capture were these sort of more challenging phenomena that are unfolding uh, in complicated and really sort of intellectually interesting ways. Uh, so this is the, I want to say, this is the official map uh, there on the right. Figure that out. Uh, of the LTER sites uh, in the LTER network it is a little out of date, uh, unfortunately, but uh, there are 25 sites, and I'm very pleased to say uh, within a few years there should be two more coastal sites added to the map. Uh, and North Temperate Lakes is pretty close to the middle there in Wisconsin, uh, designated by the NTL abbreviation, and we have two nodes to our particular uh, site. Uh, we have the Northern Highlands Lake District, uh, this is mostly in the forested northern part of Wisconsin, and then the Yahara Lake District in the agriculturally and increasingly urban dominated uh, area of southern Wisconsin on the, uh, adjacent to UW-Madison. 
So uh, what we do as part of this LTER program is first uh, we study and measure the long-term dynamics of lakes. And again, we have the seven core study lakes in the north, the Northern Highlands Lake District, and we started studying the uh, measuring, uh, or excuse me, instituting the measurement regimes in 1981. And in uh, 2000, there was the opportunity to add four lakes in southern Wisconsin to this. Uh, and we measure a suite of physical, chemical, and biological, as well as social variables at this site. And in association with that, this is a research program. We have a number of studies that are comparative studies. Uh, we do whole ecosystem experiments and, of course, modeling and synthesis uh, work as well. So and my mental picture of this is I think of those long-term measurements as sort of the core or the central of the project. And we have these shorter projects or questions that sort of weave in and out that, that add strength to that central fiber. They, some stay, many go. They may be associated with particular grants or graduate student projects and so forth. But really at the heart of it is these long-term measurements. All right. So now what I want to do is sort of jump into part two, so that's your, your, the background part of this talk, is to tell you a little bit about just some of the lessons uh, that have been learned from doing long-term research. Not just me personally, although I did learn a lot, uh, but just sort of, again, these are a lot of general lessons, and hopefully for many of you, some of these are uh, familiar or are mother's milk. Okay, so the first one, and this is one that I feel like I live a lot, every day perhaps, uh, is that it is very challenging to generate long-term data sets. Uh, there's a lot of work and investment that goes into it, and John Magnuson, who was the first uh, invest lead of the North Temperate Lakes, uh, said this very, very well, um, that this is a research project uh, coming from NSF. Uh, it has an emphasis on question-driven di research, so trying to say you're doing monitoring, which is, has, uh, I think it has bad PR. Uh, it hasn't done a good job uh, advocating for itself, and some people see monitoring as something that is not question-driven and therefore not appropriate. Uh, I think there's a good argument to be made against that, but not my uh, issue in this talk. But it needs to have a research focus. Uh, then the next challenge, of course, is over this very long time span is maintaining the continuity and integrity of the research you do as well as the data you collect and keeping track of it. There's an enormous emphasis on information management that has really been core to the success, I would argue, of LTER. Uh, and I think sort of at a larger intellectual scale, another pair of challenges that have been substantial is sort of this question of whether the priorities that we are interested in today are going to be priorities down the road, uh, you know, and, and similarly are the methods that we use today going to be appropriate down the road as well. And I can tell you that the answer to both those questions is often no. So this is just one of the realities that uh, many of the things we do or measure or ask about are relevant down the road, but some of them are not, and it's sort of managing those issues that really uh, is at the crux of some of the difficulties that you face when you try to maintain these long-term projects. Oh, and of course I did not advance this. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was doing so well there. All right. So I think John, uh, sort of, to translate these, it, I think really what it comes down to is the challenge of these long, any long-term project is trying to sustain the interest and funding and the methods that are needed to continue this sampling and analyzing the same thing in the same places in the same way year after year after year. And it is, so. Okay, so that's a practical issue that has become very clear to me as the person in charge of this project. Uh, I think there's some other much more uh, upbeat and um, exciting things that are very clear from doing these long-term projects. And I think one of them is really conspicuous to me and that I think has been known to many for a long time is that aquatic ecosystems really are fantastic laboratories for long-term research. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, this has been well spelled out by others. Uh, first and foremost, a lot of the organisms that live in lakes and streams have a relatively short generation time. And so we can see multiple generations come and go in a very reasonable period of time. 
Um, if you study many of these ecosystems, if you're interested in disturbance, it's experience, uh, repeated disturbance, again, within a reasonable time frame. Uh, and then, of course, we think of aquatic systems uh, are well known, have been well described as sort of these sensors and recorders of the surrounding environments. So they are receptive to the terrestrial and larger context in which they uh, reside and can uh, reflect those processes. And of course, within a, a very reasonable geographic extent, uh, you can get, I don't want to use the word replicate exactly, but multiple sites that can be sampled that are independent of one another, uh, giving you many places where you can ask your question and pursue your science. Uh, so the way this is sort of brought up to me as a stream ecologist working in the desert is, say, for example, you're uh, interested in studying succession. Uh, now, if you have a choice of an ecosystem in which you want to study this phenomenon, I would strongly push you toward the desert stream, uh, where you will have repeated uh, floods and successional sequences to study, as opposed to the forest, where you might have a fire, and then you have to wait you know, 50 years to do your dissertation to watch the successional sequence before you get to defend your dissertation. All right, so another lesson, and this one might seem really obvious, but you know, it's, it's really something that always surprises me, is just that everything is changing all the time. It's changing at all spatial and temporal scales. Um, we, and I think traditionally in limnology and ecology, we've, as, as sort of the original motivation for LTER has demonstrated, we're particularly good at seeing those daily and seasonal and, and short-term uh, phenomena that goes on such as shown here by the ice going out on Trout Lake. This was inspired by you, John. Um, but I, what I really want to focus on, again, is that time frame of the invisible present or sort of that decadal or longer time scale. Uh, in the subsequent series of examples, I want to show you the, the change that we have seen uh, in Wisconsin lakes. Okay, so we have seen quite a bit of change. Uh, so we'll start with some, just run, show some examples here of what we see in our lakes. We'll start with some very well-known examples of physical phenomena uh, that are ongoing in our lakes. Uh, our lakes are getting warmer. Uh, this shows a uh, sparkling lake surface water temperature uh, that has been increasing uh, slowly but surely over the period that we have been working on the lake. And then uh, we have John Magnuson's favorite data set. Uh, so I felt like I wanted to put that in there, of uh, ice duration in Lake Mendota uh, since 1850. And over that period of record, uh, Lake Mendota has basically lost about a month of ice cover on average per year, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, and I think this is a really interesting phenomenon for what, may or may not, what we may be losing for processes going on under ice. And I'll put in a plug for Stephanie Hampton's session that's coming up on Thursday. Wednesday that uh, talks about uh, phenomena going on under ice. But we certainly see these. Many other limnologists have reported these same trends. Uh, chemical changes. We see quite a few chemical changes in our lakes. Uh, this is one that is uh, very familiar here where we have decline in sulfate uh, here in one of our study lakes. Uh, that has been associated with the, uh, the implementation of the Clean Air Act, and we see the decline in sulfate going on in a pretty straightforward fashion here. Uh, and increases in dissolved organic carbon. This has already been described in a few talks uh, earlier today. Uh, and that is associated, uh, has been linked to acid rain, although there are multiple hypotheses as to what may be causing that. Uh, but it is, uh, again, another widespread phenomenon in this br uh, global browning that many people have reported from Europe and Canada and uh, North America. And uh, another very widespread phenomenon we see in our lakes as well. Uh, this is this inc increasing chloride. Uh, it's been associated with the application of road salts in winter. Uh, so we're seeing some pretty steady increases there in that in Sparkling Lake. And of course, we have lots of biological changes as well. Some of the most conspicuous and really dramatic examples are associated uh, with spe uh, aquatic invasive species. This is the woeful story of the yellow perch, a very popular fish and very tasty fish in Wisconsin uh, that seemed to suffer very badly upon the arrival of what looks like a really diminutive and generally harmless uh, rainbow smelt 
uh, but it pretty much did a number on the yellow perch population here, despite, even despite later efforts to try to get rid of the uh, smelt, uh, it has not been a good news story. So, uh, again, you know, in this, I think these examples here that I think a lot of most people in this room may be familiar with are sort of a testament to why lakes are such good laboratories for this long-term research. We can already see very clear and direct effects of the changing climate. Uh, we can see very clear and direct uh, examples of what happens with environmental policy in this case, uh, perhaps the Clean Air Act. I, um, and finally, we can also see some really direct effects of human behavior, whether in terms of how we may be applying salt to our roads in the winter or how we may be willy-nilly putting invasive species into lakes and letting them uh, do their thing. Okay, but you know, everything is changing. Uh, those are some very clear, very common and trends that we generally think we understand moderately well, though I do apparently need to take a step back on the DOC after hearing uh, Anna Kritzberg's talk uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, many of these changes uh, are not quite as we expect, or not a, quite so clear cut. So, for example, um, here's this is calcium in sparkling lake, uh, and perhaps this is a, this rapid and uh, this very clear linear increase is something that may be linked to sulfate, but it's a variable that we haven't really paid much attention, and we really, you know, what it means. Uh, maybe has been sort of yet to be explored. It may have some important implications in some parts of the world if this is also going on to be adding uh, an ingredient that may help some species uh, colonize the lake that may not be possible otherwise. Uh, sulfate, returning to this example, while we see sulfate declines very clearly and directly in some lakes and other lakes, they seem to be completely indifferent to the Clean Air Act and are showing no responses whatsoever. Uh, and these are lakes that are within a few kilometers of one another. And then we may have some other effects such as the macrophytes, uh, how they responded to the arrival of rusty crayfish uh, in Trout Lake, uh, where peak crayfish uh, hit in this year around 1990, but it wasn't until about five years later that the macrophytes actually finally started declining below historic levels. So we are seeing a lag effect here. Uh, associated with the consequences of this invasive species. So sort of a bit of a surprise in terms of that delay in terms of the cause-effect relationship. Um, and of course, after telling you guys that everything's changing, well, that's not entirely true. Not everything is changing. And as someone who is very fond of the nitrogen cycle, this one is a little disappointing, because I got to say, it looks pretty dull. Uh, total nitrogen does not seem to be doing much. Eh. Um, and I showed some very nice, though not surprisingly, some very lovely clear-cut directional trends uh, before. Not all trends are like that. There's the calcium example, uh, and it looks like the, you'll have to take my word for it, I suppose, on the threshold uh, drop there for the yellow perch that were very high and then very, very quickly went down to near uh, zero uh, densities. Uh, we see other patterns of change. We have an oscillating pattern. Those are two lake level records that are strung together from two northern highland lakes that show this uh, distinct uh, sort of near decadal pattern associated with larger uh, uh, NAO patterns uh, that are affecting the rise and fall of lake level over a 70 year period. And then we have records which I think just are best to be categorized as erratic. It's really not clear what's going on, but they are showing changes uh, in variance, certainly, and at times also showing changes in mean, and it really is not entirely clear what exactly is going on there. Those are, those are the interesting ones. Uh, and so, oops, I'm going to go back for a sec, if I can. So these are all different lakes and different variables. Uh, we can also sort of see the same uh, effect of variety showing up if we look at one variable across different lakes. And again, I'm going back to the old study here, apparently, for this talk of sulfate. Uh, here we see sulfate in our seven study lakes. Again, these are all within a few kilometers of one another. Uh, in general, the trend is certainly declining. Uh, but what we see is that uh, some lakes uh, the top lake there, this is Aliquash Lake. Uh, there is 
been no change, uh, no increase or decrease. Uh, Trout Lake right below it, uh, there was a little hiccup there, and then it sort of seemed to reset at a, at a similar low, uh, excuse me, a similar concentration that was slightly lower. Um, and then we have lakes that are declining, sometimes reaching a minimum around 2,000, other lakes reaching their minimum concentration a bit later in 2005, so we have different rates of change over time. And again, this is the same variable and lakes are all very close to one another, so really uh, the challenge there is to have uh, to know exactly why it is that these patterns and these rates are, differ so much in adjacent lakes. Okay. So this is in here, this, this is my transition slide to remind, to remind me and that I'm shifting gears now. So we have a great variety of changes that we have seen in our lakes, linear patterns, erratic patterns, and things like that. And there's really quite a diversity of change that we have seen in these things. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about data records. And uh, as I said at the beginning of this talk, as the PI, I am, I am very, very aware of how challenging it is to keep these data records going. Uh, it's hard. We are fortunate uh, to have this support from NSF so that we can do this. Of course, we are obligated to do it. Uh, and that is not a widespread phenomenon. So the first thing I would say is please, by all means, use our data. It's uh, freely available on the web, and I'm not clicking again. Um, and it's been very, it's already been very rewarding to be at this talk and hear talks this morning to see people using our data. Uh, our data are only as good as its uses, and it's just really, um, it's, it is great to see it getting, after spending all this time and effort, that it is finding its way into uh, other research projects. Um, and we have had some success doing this. Most of the data sets you can see from this histogram are pretty short, associated with individual projects of one to three years, but we are increasingly accumulating t uh, data sets now that are in that 10, 20, 30 year range. Uh, we have a couple of data sets that are even over 100 years old, like the ice duration records. I have, again, uh, was obviously very impacted by Anna Kritzberg's talk. I feel humbled after seeing uh, their data sets of 16 lakes going back to the 1880s, starting with Einar Naumann. Uh, so we still have some work to do with our duration there, but uh, we, th we think we've got a good uh, resource here that is available to the community. So it is not impossible to collect these data records, and I want to also say clearly uh, we are not alone in this effort. We do not necessarily have the market cornered on collecting long-term data sets, and this is the good news, I would say. Um, there are multiple sources of long-term records. Uh, and sort of first and foremost, I would be remiss if I didn't say that one of the, you know, the most potent collection of and longest term records of all are those that come from paleolimnological sources. Uh, and I have been made aware of this by my paleolimnological colleagues. Uh, when we, I was involved in the project putting together this 70 year data record of lake levels that was shown in the upper corner there. We were feeling very proud of ourselves. 70 years, this is awesome. Uh, and then Sarah Hotchkiss gave me a copy of her paper there in the lower left where she said, yeah, talk to me when you hit 10,000. Um, <laughs> And so I realized that really our record there sort of fits into that quadrat. <laughs> so I am fully, yes, so this is a, a good thing to keep in mind and sort of uh, puts our work in an important context. Um, there are a number of different resources for long-term data records that come from agency base of a national, regional, state monitoring programs. Uh, the Swedish monitoring program is really a remarkable one that has been used very widely and has come to have a very strong influence on limnology right now uh, that began really in earnest in the early 1970s. Uh, here in the United States, uh, there's quite a bit of monitoring that goes on. The states are required to have a monitoring program to meet the requirements of the Clean Water Act. And uh, being involved with uh, Kendra and Pat Serrano and several other excellent scientists on this CSI limnology project, we have cobbled together these uh, state data records along with a few others into Lagos. 
And it's been really revealing to see that there is a lot of data out there and a lot of it are these long-term data. So Samantha Oliver, who's giving a talk tomorrow, uh, I stole this slide shamelessly from her to show long-term records of phosphorus, uh, where you can see that there are um, over 2,000 lakes uh, with over 10 years of data in them. So we really, there's a lot of stuff out there uh, that is available for, uh, to look at these timescales. Uh, another source, and this often uh, is in partnership with the state monitoring agents' uh, efforts, is citizen science, uh, perhaps best known. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, gosh, that's terrible. You guys. So I'm just going to go back and yeah, oh wow, Sweden doesn't even show up, I'm so, all those dots are, yeah. Okay, uh, there we go, back on track, <laughs> thank you B. Uh, citizen science efforts that really strengthen and broaden the number of lakes that get sampled uh, have been really an important resource. And then, of course, I think a critical this part of the sort of the DNA of this society and of limnology as a field has been sort of individual institutes and uh, universities of folks that have really sort of taken the initiative themselves to develop these long-term records. I think there are a lot of familiar faces there. I think without a doubt, uh, no disrespect to my academic uh, history, my favorite has to be the Lake Baikal story that began with a man who made it, got his daughter doing it and then passed it on to his granddaughter who is shown in that picture there. It's, it's just, it's a fantastic story. Now these long-term individual records have been extremely important in shaping our understanding of limnology, um, but the challenge with these th is that they are individual, usually individual lakes, uh, and while they increase the temporal scale, uh, they suffer from the problem of being very site-specific, and of course uh, we know that spatial and temporal scales increase together, so the goal then is to be able to move over into that uh, larger uh, spatial extent and to string together many sites and cover large areas. Now there has been a very recent change, a relatively recent change too within the field that really helps get this, uh, this job done. And that really has been the onset of networks uh, besides LTER. And I think really LTER has played a very important role, sort of a role model for networks. Uh, there's been spin-off from LTER as the International LTER program. Uh, they started in 1993 and has several sites throughout the globe. Uh, and I think really one that is probably familiar to many people in this room is GLEON, the Global Lakes Ecological Observatory Network that began in 2005. Uh, and the map there shows all the GLEON sites, and I bet there are a lot of GLEON members in the room. Uh, and I just recently learned that there is within Gleon, there's sort of this uh, nested hierarchy in Europe that starts with Gleon and goes down to NetLake, which is a Europe-wide lake monitoring program. Then there's a, a French system, and then they have also within France a mountain system for the Alps. So there's really, it's been quite an interesting prolifer excuse me, proliferation. Uh, another well-known network that is connecting long-term data records in disparate parts of the world together has been the Great Lakes, uh, excuse me, the Global Lakes Temperature Collaboration. Uh, and this, this group came out with a very important paper just in December uh, that documented this phenomena of global lake warming at the entire scale there, showing that, uh, there's a map there, <laughs> showing the lakes getting warmer. Okay, so shifting gears once again, uh, after talking about the data records, so I've given you guys a few of the, uh, the three building blocks here of uh, what LTER is and what we do at North Temperate Lakes, about some of the trends and patterns and phenomena that we've seen. I've talked to you guys about data records uh, to show that there are really quite a few long-term data records out there. And I would say that these are the three raw ingredients that put us in, uh, the sort of in a remarkable place in time right now uh, for the science. So, the, and this itself also has three ingredients of remarkableness. Uh, first, uh, you know, this, we are in the epoch of the Anthropocene now, and, and many have argued, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna buy you a beverage, B. Uh, that one of the hallmarks, one of the many hallmarks of the Anthropocene is that we are changing sort of the, the temporal dynamics 
of the world. Uh, we're accelerating rates of change. The world has changed more in the past 50 years than arguably it has in its history. Uh, we're having a series of novel changes that are showing up. Uh, we are altering disturbance cycles. We are changing the growing season. Uh, this is sort of demonstrated here with the timeline of Lake Mendota showing just an increasing number of phenomena that are showing up and impinging itself upon the lake. Uh, the second, of course, is the one that I hit is that we are now at this point where these long-term data records are sort of coming to maturity. They're coming to, you know, being multi-decadal. So we are beginning to see the invisible present through these data sets. They are accumulating not just at our particular study site, but around the world. And this means that really for the first time as these uh, data sets lengthen and the number of them are pulled together, that we are now having the opportunity to capture the slow and the rare and the complex and the variable. And a third critical ingredient here is at the same time uh, we are experiencing a great expansion in terms of our computational and statistical capacities that we have as we amass these large and complicated data sets. We are amassing the tools and the capacity to do something with them. Uh, these are just a couple of examples here of some data sets uh, that show sort of the use of very big uh, data sets using statistical, new statistical analyses. On the left is a series of uh, plots of Secchi disk uh, water clarity trends that Noah Lodig is going to talk about on Tuesday as well, uh, where he was able to cluster time series from over 600 lakes. Uh, and the other example there on the right is a really elegant piece of work done by Kale and Carey and colleagues uh, looking at the time series of Lake Mendota phytoplankton communities in both sort of the traditional ways of time seri uh, plotting the time series and the annual averages, but then also decomposing these time series using wavelet uh, analyses. And there are many, many new statistical tools that we're adapting from other fields, Kalman filters and change point analyses and so forth, uh, that are really finding their way into our toolkit and becoming the tools that we need to take on these new data sets. Okay, so again, these three ingredients, these remarkable times are this, this period of rapid change and novel change, the accumulation and growth of these multi-decadal uh, aquatic data sets from around the world, uh, and then the expanded uh, computational and statistical capacity to do something. So all we need right now are some really good questions. So I think this is just really, to me, a remarkable time because we have these raw ingredients uh, that we can now look at ecosystems sort of in a new way that just has never been bef possible before and to begin to not only find out or to gain new insights about how lakes and rivers work, but just sort of to understand the temporal ecology of ecosystems in general. Which shows up there. Uh, so again, you are the audience. Uh, you are the guys who are to come up with the very interesting questions. Uh, you know, I've pondered this a little bit. Uh, and we can begin to think of some of these things, or I should say I work with colleagues who also have pondered it, and they've come up with some good ideas. Uh, and some of the things, for example, we have these diverse collections of data sets, and instead of looking at one or a few variables, we can now look at suites of variables and see how they behave. We can see if they're sort of families of temporal patterns that occur amongst lakes or amongst rivers. Um, are there, uh, are, why do these happen? Why is it that variable A has this sort of a tendency to change or that lake has a, has a particular characteristic time series? So we can start delving into these with multiple responses. Um, and another approach, this is one I think uh, that uh, Ryan Batt uh, has been involved in and in really taking advantage of the LTER data set has to do with sort of examining the extremes. And we pay quite a bit of attention to the extremes because this is really where big things can change big floods or big population outbreaks or whatever the case may be. Uh, and he's been applying some uh, extreme value analyses to these. And uh, what this is going to be a little bit tough to explain, uh, but because there's some gray data under there. But the uh, blue dots highlight the extreme, the maximum of an annual maximum of a time series for a the blue variable. And then the red is uh, the annual extremes for a red variable. 
And what you can do is take these extreme values and fit a distribution to them and describe the shape of that extreme value distribution by a shape parameter uh, that has a funny Greek name, so I'm just going to call it the shape parameter, uh, that describes the fatness, if you like, of that tail, sort of how far out does it go. And these, again, these fat tails are things that we are, are ecologically very concerning and very interesting because these are the ones that really that are exceeding historic records are really when dramatic events may happen. And so what Ryan was able to do is he took the LTER data records and did this sort of a fat tail analysis on it to see what sort of variables are really extreme. What are the record setting types of variables? Uh, and he was able to use 595 time series uh, to do this analysis. And he just sort of coarsely categorized them into physical, chemical, biological, and meteorological. And what he found was, was that the most likely to have these sort of extreme events to be most record-setting type variables are the biological variables. Now, on one hand, this might make sort of seem intuitively to make sense to us, but this is an analysis that we've never done with ecological variables before. And what it's sort of showing us is that there is sort of an amplification effect that goes on between the physical drivers that these lakes experience and the biological responses. And it is interesting to me to discover that the two most fatted tailed uh, responses, one is sunfish in Lake Mendota, and the other one is a rotifer. I don't know what that means. Uh, and we can flip this analysis around uh, and consider the sort of the frequency of extreme events. How long do we have to wait before we see another sort of record breaking event? And again, it is sooner for these biological variables than they are for the physical or meteorological variables. So these are much more, again, amplifying the changes that they're experiencing. And I think there's really quite a bit of opportunity here to really begin to unpackage these extreme events and understand why it is that they uh, have those fat tails. And I think another opportunity uh, that is here is really as we lengthen our ecological time series is to make linkages uh, to the paleo records uh, to really sort of bridge that gap a bit more. This is beginning to be done. There's some people that do it quite well, but I think as, again, we can uh, have the opportunity to reach out and sort of expand our understanding of, of even more temporal scales by, by explicitly linking ecological and paleo limnological time series. And I did not advance the slide. There we go. Um, and I leave that for others to do. So those are sort of the big points that I really want to make. I mean, these, I think, they're just lots and lots of opportunities. And we've just really begun to open the door. It's fun to be able to see these time series show up more and more often uh, in the literature, in talks at this meeting. And I think really, again, uh, these are remarkable times as we've seen these time series uh, progress. I've just thrown a few examples out. I think there are going to be many, many more that you can come up with. Uh, really, all we need are the brain power of some young scientists to sort of pursue this and, and ask these questions and take advantage if you fold some long-term research uh, into your research portfolio. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. And it's almost time for cocktails. We're going to fix this issue before tomorrow's plenary, don't you worry. And, and maybe the bulbs, too. <laughs> so who has questions for Emily? We've got some time, although we are going out to the courtyard yeah. soon. I can't see anybody. I know. It's... We're being blinded. Oh, they're heading for the lights. Questions? <laughs> Everybody wants a beer outside, don't they? There's one. So much of the problem is that it's 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think this is something that we have been very actively grappling with. Um, and I think some things uh, we have successfully gotten rid of more, well, not gotten rid of, are in the process of reevaluating uh, the value of uh, measuring things ourselves. There are some things that are very straightforward, lake levels. Uh, we have a, Noah Lodig, who's in the audience, has a dream of retiring our lake level boards. Uh, but I think, you know, and there will be some things that we will be able to replace and not have measurements, but uh, never everything. I think there's always got to be, you've always got to go out in the field. I think there's a lot of value to always going out in the field and seeing it and touching it and uh, knowing what's going on at your site. And the other thing about technology, uh, you may just be trading one labor investment for another. The information management is, of course, not trivial. Uh, and I think uh, if I were to offer advice to anybody uh, embarking on long-term research is to please be sure you have a plan to take care of your data and know what you're doing with your data. So you may just be moving it inside. So, so that problem will never entirely go away. So. <laughs> All right, well, let's thank Emily once again.